It's a tremendous honor this afternoon to interview Jim Sedlak. Jim is the vice president of the American Life League and the host of a weekly pro-life radio program on the Radio Maria Network. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Physics from Manhattan Co College in the Bronx and a Master of Science in Industrial Administration from Union Graduate College in Schenectady, New York. He began his professional career as a physics teacher at Marymount High School in New York City and then joined IBM, where he worked for 30 years as a research physicist and a manager for corporate new products release and control methodologies. While working for IBM, Jim published four invention disclosures, received seven company awards, ran numerous corporate-wide task forces, achieved the dual position of senior engineer and senior operations analyst, and was recognized as the corporate expert on the release and control of engineering changes. Besides having an accomplished business life, Jim joined the pro-life movement in 1980. He is a true veteran of the cause. He is the co-founder of STOP, that's S-T-O-P-P, -P, Stop Planned Parenthood, in 1985. He retired from IBM in 1993 to devote a full-time effort to the pro-life cause. In 1994, Jim founded STOP International on the global stage as its president and merged it into the American Life League in 1998. In 1993, Jim was identified by Planned Parenthood itself as one of the 15 most active fighters against us. I must say a tremendous compliment to you, Jim. He is a national and international speaker who has given his life to the protection of the unborn and to the protection of our young people from the corrupting influences of what is the most hideous and satanic organization on the earth. Jim, it's a tremendous honor to have you with us. Thank you for entertaining this interview. Well, thank you, Father. It is an absolute honor to be here with you. I'd like to start um, this interview by asking you a little bit about Planned Parenthood for our watchers who ha aren't very educated. Um, Tragically, recent decades have witnessed our own American society running very quickly from the road of reason to madness. We have not only allowed Planned Parenthood to exist in our nation since 1916, you've informed me that this is in fact their centennial uh, in America, but since President Obama has been in office, he has thrown the weight of the U.S. Treasury behind Planned Parenthood by funding them with hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer monies. Abortion is now a universal American business. And the majority of Americans who are pro-life are being forced to participate in wickedness of the highest order. If presidential Republican candidate Donald Trump is representative of any significant segment of America, then a significant segment of our nation has no real idea what Planned Parenthood is and what Planned Parenthood does. You are one of the most informed Americans about Planned Parenthood, having given decades of your life to studying this organization intimately. Can you begin our interview by sharing with us a, a general survey of the history of Planned Parenthood and its raison d'etre? Why does it exist? Sure, absolutely. Uh, Planned Parenthood began, or at least Planned Parenthood dates its beginnings to October the 16th, 1916, when a woman named Margaret Sanger and two of her friends opened a birth control clinic in New York City. Uh, and uh, everything started spreading from there. Margaret Sanger brought with her three basic philosophies, uh, which still exist in the organization today. Her first philosophy was uninhibited sexual activity. She believed that anybody should be able to have sex whenever they want, with whoever they want, regardless of whether or not they were married to that person, in fact, regardless of whether they were married to somebody else. Um, Margaret uh, advocated for sex. Planned Parenthood today sees no problems with anybody having sex, regardless of age, whether they're 11, 12, 13 years old. In, in Planned Parenthood's mind, they should be able to have sex. They should be able to have all the sex that they want. Margaret Sanger also brought a philosophy of small family size. Margaret was the sixth child in a, in a family of 11 children, so she grew up in a large family. 
Her mother died at the age of 52 from, from tuberculosis, but she always blamed her mother's death on the fact that she had so many children. Hmm. And so she fought all of her life uh, to eliminate large families. Margaret considered that, that a large family was anything more than two children. So she fought all of her life for, for family size of two or less children. She would allow three children in some cases, but that was it. Nobody should ever be allowed to have more than three children. She had a problem, though, because she wanted lots and lots of sex and no children. Sure. All right, so her answer to that was birth control. In fact, many historians credit Margaret Sanger with coming up with the phrase birth control. Uh, birth control, today when we use the term birth control and contraception, we tend to use those words interchangeably, but they are in fact two different things. Contraception in its purest sense is the prevention of conception, uh, basically the prevention of creation of a new human being. Birth control is the prevention of the births of mm -hmm. those human beings. We know that Margaret Sanger, when she talked about birth control, advocated for birth control in the largest sense. She put out a, family, uh, a pamphlet named Family Limitation in 1915, the year before she started Planned Parenthood. And in that pamphlet, she listed all of the methods of birth control known at the time, and she included abortion hmm. as a method of birth control. Uh, and so... Planned Parenthood has, from its beginning, been a big proponent of contraception and then birth, uh, abortion to take care of contraceptive failures. Uh, her third philosophy was that of eugenics. Margaret Sanger believed in the purification of the race through selective breeding. She said that, that individuals who are physically handicapped or mentally handicapped or what in their day they, they call feeble-minded should not be allowed to have children at all. Mm. Others should be allowed to have children based on uh, their heredity and based on how well they, they were. Uh, she actually put out a serious program in the 1930s for birthing licenses in the United States. If you were going to have a, a child in the United States, according to Sanger, you would have to have a license from the government. Uh, obviously, it's not happened here in the United States, but Planned Parenthood is one of the major supporters of the Chinese population control program, which is one child per family. But even that one child, they have to have a permit from the government to have even their first child or their mm -hmm. one child. So, so it's, it's, her ideas are being used, just not being used uh, here in the United States. She also, in, in a, uh, a document that she produced called The Plan for Peace, said that people of dysgenic stock should be given their choice of sterilization or confinement on a farm for the rest of their lives. Uh, so this is the, the philosophies that came. Now, Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany um, made eugenics into a bad name. You, you, after World War II, you couldn't talk about eugenics. So Planned Parenthood started talking about the world overpopulation problem. Yes. Okay? There is not an overpopulation problem, but that's what they talked about. Their solutions were the same as their eugenics philosophy. They just didn't use the word eugenics anymore. And even today, when, when we, everybody in the world knows that our real problem is too few children in the world, where the, the number of old people outstrip the, the number of young people and the whole population pyramid is upside down, Planned Parenthood is still talking about the overpopulation problem, and their solution to today's real problem is to kill off the old people. Yes. And, and so that's, that's how Planned Parenthood has, has started, with those three basic philosophies. They still exist in the organization today, uh, and, and they're still pushing them in their various ways all around the world, but particularly here in the United States, because Planned Parenthood started here in the United States. Jim, what is the exact relationship between Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood? Is there a, an intimate connection there? What is the relationship yes. between the two? Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood. Okay. She served as the first president of Planned Parenthood. Uh, she was the editor. I mean, everything that you would expect the founding president to do. In today's world, uh, Planned Parenthood's highest award that they still give every year is the Margaret Sanger Award. Um, you know, there have been a lot of noted people who have received the Margaret Sanger Award. Uh, the other part of... of including Hillary Clinton. In, including Hillary Clinton. They received the, the, uh, the Margaret Sanger Award. Um, and another uh, thing that they do is they give out awards to the media, uh, radio, television, magazines, etc., and they call those awards the Maggie Awards. 
All right, so Planned Parenthood has never walked away from, from Margaret Sanger. They have never denied Margaret Sanger. Um, they, they still think that she is the wonderful, wonderful, heroic woman who started their organization. Incredible. Incredible. Jim, would you tell our, our, our audience a little bit more about the expanse and reach of Planned Parenthood? You've told us about its philosophies that it inherited in, in its own intellectual patrimony from Margaret Sanger. She started it. What was the progression of its growth? Okay. Uh, what happened is, is when Margaret Sanger started the organization in 1916, uh, they, were, they were advocating for contraception and abortion. They had a major problem because contraception was actually illegal in the United States at that time. Uh, you could not manufacture or sell contraceptive devices. In addition to that, contraception was condemned by every major church denomination. There was no church that allowed for the use of contraception. And on top of all of that, they couldn't even mail information about contraception in the mails because the Comstock laws forbade the sending of any sex information in the mail. So they very quickly decided that they couldn't fight the, the battle for contraception and the battle for abortion at the same time. And so they decided to, to split the two and really push the, the battle for legalizing contraception and then put the abortion battle off until after contraception had been legalized. So during the 20s and 30s and 40s, Margaret Sanger wrote a lot of articles against abortion. Um, and, and people say, well, see, Sanger was against abortion. No, she wasn't against abortion, but politically she had to say that in order to get the contraception idea. Uh, Sanger knew that she had to overcome those three major obstacles. Uh, they, she worked first on the churches in her book in 1922, which was called The Pivot of Civilization, which is her defining work. Mm -hmm. All right. She talked about work, working with a theologian of the Church of England, uh, William Ralph Inge, who was dean of St. Paul's Cathedral, wow. uh, to get the Church of England to accept contraception. And in fact, her first major victory was at the Lambeth Conference of the Church of England in 1930, in which the church recognized the use of contraception by married couples under certain limited circumstances, but it opened the door, okay? Uh, and, and it opened the door for the use, and of course, other churches followed after that. So that was her first major victory. Her second major victory came in the 1940s when, through a series of court cases, judges uh, handed down decisions that basically forbade the enforcement of the Comstock laws when it came to anything having to do with reproductive services, um, contraception, etc. So it opened the U.S. mail to, to not only contraceptive information, but to sex information. Uh, it is not an accident that, if, that years later, the Playboy Foundation gave a large donation to Planned Parenthood Federation of America because they opened the U.S. mails uh, to, to the... Uh, uh, to perversion. To perversion. And just in case people think they've changed, in 1996, Congress passed the Communications Decency Act. The purpose of the Communications Decency Act, which was passed by both houses of Congress and signed by the president, was to keep pornography off the Internet in the United States. Oh. It is Planned Parenthood and the ACLU who took that to court and got it declared unconstitutional. Yeah, of course. So the same organization that, that opened the mails to pornographies in the 1940s has now kept the Internet open to pornography here in the United States uh, in, in this century. All right? just, just an outrageous type of thing. Her final victory in the fight to get contraception legalized came when the, the Supreme Court of the United States handed down what is called the Griswold decision. Now, Griswold was Estelle Griswold, who was head of Planned Parenthood in the state of Connecticut and, and brought lawsuits because in the state of Connecticut, she could not sell contraception. And the case went to the Supreme Court in, on June 7, 1965. The Supreme Court handed down the Griswold decision, striking down all the laws against contraception. And more importantly, it was in that decision that the Supreme Court made up the constitutional right of privacy in sexual matters, sure. in, the, in what they said, the penumbra of the Constitution, which is the shadows of the Constitution, they found this right. So all of these cases and all of this effort was all done by Planned Parenthood. The interesting part is that that was handed down in June of 1965. Planned Parenthood, 10 years earlier in 1955, had run a national conference on abortion to mm -hmm. determine 
where the attitudes on, of abortion were and where it would be easiest to get abortion legalized in which states. And they put in place a plan and then waited until contraception was legalized. Contraception was legalized June of 65. The first state to liberalize the abortion laws was Colorado in 1967, just two years later. That doesn't happen if you don't have your plans in place. Of course. Uh, the legislation was introduced in Colorado by Richard Lamb, who was the son of a Planned Parenthood executive from Florida. Um, and, and, you know, it has all gone to, to heck in a handbasket since then. You've identified very clearly, documented the connection between Margaret Sanger and Planned Parenthood in the promotion of contraception, in the overthrow of decency laws. What about abortion? Can you take us from Comstock and Griswold to Roe v. Wade? Was Planned Parenthood involved in pushing Roe v. Wade? Yes, Planned Parenthood has been involved in, in, in bringing abortion to the United States. Um, you know, and that's the way we phrase it that, that Planned Parenthood brought. We've, we've talked about the fact uh, that they are the ones who got the laws against contraception broken down. Uh, they, were, they were the ones who, who had the conference in 1955 to put in place the plans uh, for getting abortion legalized. Um, so, so they brought the court case that found the right to privacy in sexual matters. They have since then pushed a lot of cases through the Supreme Court uh, to to they were they had lawyers and stuff involved in the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, to to, uh, to which of course is the decision that they decriminalized abortion here in the United States, relying on the Griswold decision to yes. do that. Uh, they also pressed laws that that said that that uh, young people could have access to contraception. Uh, there's a Supreme Court decision that says that any child, any woman, regardless of age, including 10, 11, 12-year-old females, can have access to reproductive services confidentially without their parents' knowledge. And that was another case brought by Planned Parenthood. So they just bring court case after court case to open it up so, so that they can ply their trade, make their millions of dollars, and, and prey on the young people in this country. 70% of Planned Parenthood's customers are under the age of 25. Mm. All right, so it's the young people. It's the high school and sure. college girls that sure. are the ones that suffer from Planned Parenthood. Sure, mostly without parental knowledge. Mostly without parental knowledge, yes. Oof. Jim, I'd like to move on to another question. Uh, recently, uh, the Orthodox and the Catholic worlds have been uh, amazed at the uh, first time meeting between Pope Francis and the Russian Orthodox Patriarch Kirill in Havana. And there, those two esteemed uh, religious leaders issued a common statement. I was so pleased to read their common affirmation about the dignity of traditional marriage, about their uh, common Orthodox and Catholic affirma affirmation of marital and family ethics, especially with regards to contraception and abortion. It seems that to many believers and to scholars and to Orthodox Catholic and Evangelical cultural commentators that we have basically won our people to the truth about abortion. More and more Americans are now self-identifying as pro-life, a majority of Americans. I still would say basically have won them. We have a lot of work to do still. But it seems that statistically we have lost the people, especially the millennials, especially the younger people, to the truth of the churches about sex, contraception, and homosexuality. Uh, and I'm wondering why you think that is, that we haven't had the same success in convincing our people that contraception uh, is evil and that homosexuality is unnatural and perverse. Why have we not had the same success in those spheres that we have had in convincing them that abortion is wrong? Well, I think there's, there's a lot of factors, obviously, involved in that. Uh, Planned Parenthood has a, a very strong program of pushing contraception because they know the fact that if they can get contraception, abortion just follows from it. Um, and so they, they will keep their right to, to abortion with this contraception. But as we said from the beginning, they have always advocated for, for the use of, of today what is so-called contraception because most of the methods today of contraception kill 
uh, human beings in the womb by preventing implantation. Yes. Planned Parenthood won't tell them. And there's a lot of uh, even pro-life groups in this country who stay away from the contraception battle. There's a lot of, there's not a lot of effort to fight contraception among the pro-life community. Um, when, when we look at laws being passed in this country and the various churches speaking out against the laws, they always focus in on the abortion part, but they don't focus in on the contraception part. Yeah. So people in this country are not hearing their religious leaders of whatever faith really being strong on fighting legislation that includes payment for contraception, implementation of contraception programs. So they get the idea that contraception is not as bad as yes. abortion, okay? Yes. Um, and and that, that's really the, the sum of what's happening. Uh, what they don't understand is, is that, you know, what, what the church has long understood, uh, even from, from uh, uh, the Apostle Paul, who wrote in Corinthians that all other sins are sins outside the body, but sexual sins are sins against the body itself. They are among the worst kind of sins, but we're not treating them like that. Yes. And, and we have to get to our people and say, this is as bad as abortion. Right? Uh, I've had many priests around the country tell, tell me what you said, and that is we've got the kids on abortion, but we don't have them on sex. Yes. And, and Planned Parenthood is, is spreading a religion in, in this country. Uh, the religion that they're spreading is known as secular humanism, uh, and it has been declared by parts of the U.S. government as a religion. Um, and and they, there's this religious of secular humanism basically says there may or may not be a God, but it doesn't make any difference because God has no effect here on earth. What's right or wrong in any situation, man decides, and therefore they push forward the use of contraception as something that is good when it is not something that is yes. good, when it is leading us and leading our young people to hell. Yes. Well, this is one of the great encouragements is to see collaboration between the Orthodox and the Catholic on these important issues. We have long admired, we Orthodox have long admired the Catholic devotion to the pro-life movement. You, the Catholic Church leads in this nation for sure, and probably in the world, uh, leads the, the fight for the protection of the life of unborn children. Uh, we Orthodox have a very clear and established teaching with regards to abortion and with regards to contraception. Um, although there are many people, especially in our country, who have received catechetical, catechetical instruction through the universities, through Planned Parenthood, through a diverse media onslaught, uh, and aren't aware of the fact that there are many, many saints who have taught, especially contemporary saints in the last hundred years, who have universally, in complete unanimity, forbidden contraception as well as abortion. In fact, I challenge uh, Orthodox who tell me that contraception is fine, it's just abortion that's wrong. I challenge them to present a single witness from the saints, a single witness that one saint that has ever blessed the use of artificial contraception. I'm still waiting. I've been a priest almost 25 years. I'm still waiting because there isn't a single one. Right. The church fathers ta have talked about contraception in very detailed language for 20 centuries. Um, in fact, uh, early fathers, fathers in the 4th and 5th century even, had such a detailed language with regards to contraception that they were able to make a specification between abortifacient contraception and non-abortifacient contraception. They were able to distinguish them. They forbade both, but they were able to use language, Greek language, that even de deciphered between those two types of contraception. And even types of contraception, I remember reading a 5th century B.C. Greek pharmacology book that, that had an emphasis in gynecology that listed forms of contraception uh, that, like we would know them today, uh, spermicides, burial methods, chemical treatments, coitus interruptus, detailed teaching. This is not something that's new. What's new is the cultural insanity to embrace it. Uh, what, what was viewed as strange and irregular even by the ancient Greeks today is considered by Planned Parenthood and large segments of our society as perfectly natural. So it's, it's wonderful to see uh, statements like were issued by Pope Francis and Patriarch Kirill declaring before the world our unanimity in defending the truth, especially in the marriage of sexual and marriage family ethics, um, do you see a growing collaboration happening um, between Christians uh, on, on these issues? 
Well, I, I, I think that we need to have that. We, we do see some of that happening. We have a lot of uh, non-Catholics who join our fight against Planned Parenthood. Very often they'll come into the fight fighting abortion, but then as they learn about what's going on and as they know more and they see more, uh, they, they suddenly realize contraception is not good either, okay? And, and they begin to understand the fight against contraception. You know, Planned Parenthood has a success story. They, they have an area of the world that they think uh, is success, and that's Europe, uh, particularly France, Germany, and the Netherlands. They think they've had major success there. They sent a group of people from the United States over to study why they were successful in these countries, and they come back and to let Planned Parenthood here know so that Planned Parenthood could do the same thing here. Uh, so there was a team from Oregon who went over. They studied the whole situation. They came back, and their conclusion was it was not any specific program or product the conclusion was to change the societal thinking, to, to make it the society accept that sex between unmarried young people was natural and normal and led to them being more sexually healthy adults. Yes. Um, and so their, their idea is change the culture, get the culture to accept. And so every time anybody hears somebody say that sex between teenagers is normal, that you're never going to stop teenagers from having sex. If they let that go unchallenged, Planned Parenthood is winning. Of course. You have to challenge that every time you hear it. And I think more and more people of, of various denominations are beginning to get that message and to beginning to understand that, no, we can't. We have to do better for our young people than just accepting that they can ruin their lives by engaging in, in forbidden sexual activities. Jim, for almost 25 years as a priest, I have been telling my people that Planned Parenthood is the most satanic institution, the greatest evil expressed on an institutional level in our nation. I've taught them that Planned Parenthood and family planning is really Planned Barrenhood and family banning. Uh, and during these years, I've led regular prayer vigils, as have many priests throughout the country, in front of Planned Parenthood abortion clinics. That's something that our youth do. I've tried to galvanize participation in pro-life marches, to support our local pregnancy counseling centers, and more. Just really grasping for ways to push back, grasping for ways to defend the truth, and not really knowing how to do it. Uh, nevertheless, from my perspective, I've seen the influence of Planned Parenthood become more universal. I've seen it more in the media. I've seen it more referred to by political leaders. And I'm wondering uh, for your counsel. I'm seeking for your counsel. I'm not an easily discouraged person. I'm not a pessimistic person. But even I myself wonder sometimes if we are being successful in the fight against Planned Parenthood. How can we push back against this satanic beast, this false prophet that has arisen from the depths of the earth and that is swallowing up our children? How do we stop this evil? Okay. Um, the, the basic answer is you stop them one town at a time. Uh, you don't try to go after Planned Parenthood in the entire United States or the entire world. You tell people that in your town, if there is a Planned Parenthood facility, you want to shut them down. Okay, And there are methods to do that, and we've been working on that for some 30 years on shutting down Planned Parenthood. So, so you, you, the focus has to be a local focus. Uh, part of what we have to do is we have to teach our young people to respect human life, to respect every human being's right to exist from the moment of creation to, to death. And, and we have to have programs to do that, American Life League, uh, actually has a program called the Culture of Life Studies Program uh, that, that is, has been rolled out to much success. Uh, it's a kindergarten through, through 12th grade um, unit studies is what they call it. It's not a curriculum. It is just things that can be used at various times to inc inculcate in our children a respect for every human being's life. That becomes, you know, number one, if you will, because if they don't respect every human being's life, they're not going to be motivated to stop Planned Parenthood. So, so the education of our young people is, is very important. But then it is the focus on Planned Parenthood in the local communities because once you bring the focus down to the local community, Planned Parenthood's billions of dollars and great political influence doesn't count. 
right? It is everybody's fighting in their town with people they grow up to who with who have kids who go to the same school that, that the pro-life kids go to. And so it becomes a, a, a doable and winnable battle. Uh, to give you an idea, back in, in 1995, Planned Parenthood had 938 clinics across the country. Bill Clinton had been elected president in the year uh, 1992. He took over in 93. Planned Parenthood announced the goal of having 2,000 clinics by the year wow. 2000. Wow. Okay? It's now 2016, so I'm happy to tell you they never made it. In fact, they never made it to 1,000. Uh, 938 was the highest they got. Since then, they have been closing down clinics at a very rapid rate. And at the end of 2015, they had 645 clinics. So we've closed just about 300 of Planned Parenthood's clinics uh, since 1995. And that is local people fighting local battles uh, in their own towns and getting Planned Parenthood out of town. And that's what we have to do. Uh, we we see it in Planned Parenthood's numbers. The latest numbers from Planned Parenthood is that they have 2,500,000 uh, unduplicated customers uh, last year. Five years ago, that number was 3 million. So they've lost a half a million customers Beautiful. in the last five years because of all of the focus that people have on local communities. You know, Jim, I've been breathless just six months ago when... This young Southern Californian hero, David Delayden, um, who invested with his friends in this incredible um, undercover expose of Planned Parenthood, scoring, in my opinion, one of the most stellar victories for the pro-life movement in order to expose the, the grossest of immoral and illegal deeds uh, that Planned Parenthood does, which is the trafficking in the sale of aborted baby parts, altering abortion procedures to secure greater access to higher quality baby organs, and then trying to make a great profit under the radar and, and uh, without being punished since they're breaking federal law. If our audience wishes to learn more about that, um, and I'm sure some of you who are watching may be wondering what I'm saying, I, I want to direct you to an interview that David Delighton did on this radio station, on Ancient Faith Radio, uh, with interviewer Kevin Allen at the end of last year about his undercover sting operation. You can go to Ancient Faith Radio and just search David Delighton with Kevin Allen and get to that interview. But the, the positive results seem to have been numerous. Uh, our Congress has engaged in very serious ongoing investigations, some of which are still going on about Planned Parenthood. Numerous state governments have considered defunding Planned Parenthood, and some have. Uh, nevertheless, we've seen the great links to which certain tyrannical rulers from the White House, sad to say, all the way down to the state level at attorneys general and even certain city attorneys, so ideologically committed to the right to kill unborn children that they are not willing to be bothered with facts, even facts of the grossest illegal nature and have only one resolve, which is to punish the messenger, to kill the prophet. And so these, these uh, legal uh, representatives, instead of defending the law, have tried to punish David, sadly, just this week, just a few days ago, here in California. Uh, David's personal apartment was raided by the FBI at the order of our California Attorney General, uh, Kamala Harris, his personal computer was seized, as well as other of his possessions. I feel so badly having some FBI in my own parish. I just was thinking how bad I feel for those FBI officers who, had to, who thought they had to carry out that immoral order to, to raid this hero's apartment, who is simply bringing to light this uh, great, horrible, horrible atrocity in our country. What do you think is the significance, uh, short and long term, of this uh, Center for Med Medical Progress, the, these 12 or more videos, these expose videos, what will this mean for Planned Parenthood in the future, short term and long term? Well, I think this is a disaster for Planned Parenthood. Uh, what we've seen already just, and, you know, all these videos were released beginning in July of last year, which means all of the numbers that we talk about, the, the loss of customers of Planned Parenthood happened before these videos released, so we think there's going to be a more significant drop in, in customers uh, based on, on the release of these videos. We've seen 
that people around the country have been highly motivated to fight Planned Parenthood as a result of these videos. I'll give you an example. Here in California, Planned Parenthood operates 110 uh, clinics in California. Uh, there was a national day of, of protest on, on August 22nd last year to get people out in front of Planned Parenthood um, clinics across the country. Here in California, of the 110 facilities, there were protests outside of 61 of them. Okay? Incredible. Fantastic number. Uh, since then, we have also been engaging uh, an effort here in California and, and to, to come out and to educate people and, and give them some ideas on the how to succeed locally. And we've met with a large number of these 61 people who organized those, those conferences, uh, those protests outside of Planned Parenthood. And one of the things that has struck me is that many of the people that I've met have told me that this was the first time that they have ever done anything pro-life. Incredible. All right. So the motivation to the pro-life community from these videos has been absolutely outstanding. The, the other part of it is people who view the videos. Yes, there's a lot of illegal activity shown in the videos, uh, but what really strikes them is the callousness of the employees of Planned Parenthood who talk about uh, dissecting and, and cutting up body parts and, and providing them for research and stuff with, with no more emotion than if they were talking about selling automobile parts. Yes. Uh, just the absolute just lack of any kind of, of compassion yes. from the Planned Parenthood people. Have truly this, dehumanized. Truly dehumanizing, right. Um, and have, to, have really um, galvanized people against Planned Parenthood. You know, C Cecile Richards, the, the national president of Planned Parenthood, said recently we have to humanize abortion, okay? Uh, because it's, it's obvious that they, you know, it's so dehumanized within the Planned Parenthood culture. So I think these, these videos, and, and we are a visual society. Yes. You know, it's, it's interesting that, that uh, Mark Crutcher from Life Dynamics did this same kind of thing uh, back in 2003, but he didn't have videos. He had all of the documentation. He had all of the, the orders from companies and, and what was being provided and how much for each part. But there were no videos, and it really it, it, it stirred up some activity, but it fairly quickly died out. But now there are videos. Now there are things that people can see, and, and especially our young people, uh, videos is what they respond to. Yes, um, and, and so it's really going to have long-term I think it could help spend the end of, uh, of Planned Parenthood. It's, it's really going to have a major effect. And that's why the other side is going to such great lengths to try to get these videos out. Yes. You know, they can claim that they're not real. They can claim that they've been highly edited. They know it's not true. Yes. They, they know, you know, experts have testified that it's not true, that these things have not been highly edited uh, and, and certainly have, are not misrepresenting what was discussed uh, and they are so afraid of these videos. That's why you're seeing things like, like the rating of the Leiden's apartment. You mentioned that this may have a tremendous positive contribution to eradicating Planned Parenthood. Really, Jim, I make my cross. May God bless that. May we see an end to Planned Parenthood. And also, may he strengthen you in your beautiful work. Thank you for what you're doing on behalf of our country. Thank you for what you're doing for the truth uh, in the United States and abroad. May God give you strength. Keep going. Well, thank you, and, and thank you for all you do in front of the abortion facilities and the work of producing videos like this. Uh, together, we're, we're going to make sure that Planned Parenthood closes their doors and gets out of town. Amen.